Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with some juice to get you through the long night. And we're going to be talking about the long night, Azora High, and more specifically, the forging of Lightbringer. And just what is going on, and more importantly, what happened all those years ago. As the first men established their realms following the pact, little troubled them save their own feuds and wars, or so the histories tell us. It is also from these histories that we learn of the long night. Fear is for the long night, when the sun hides for years and children are born and live and die, all in darkness. That is the time for fear, my little lord, when the white walkers move through the woods. The long night, a long night, maybe more, depending on how accurate the timeline is, did occur. But what ended the long night is up for debate. According to the world of ice and fire, the long night occurred in somewhat of a global fashion and people everywhere were affected, which led to multiple tales of what ended it. Lomas Longstrider in his Wonders Made by Man recounts meeting descendants of the Roinar in the ruins of the festival city of Koroin who have tales of a darkness that made the Roin dwindle and disappear, her waters frozen as far south as the joining of the Sahoru. According to these tales, the return of the sun came only when a hero convinced Mother Roin's many children, lesser gods, such as the Crab King and the Old Man of the River, to put aside their bickering and join together to sing a secret song that brought back the day. It is also written that there are annals in a shy of such a darkness and of a hero who fought against it with a red sword. His deeds are said to have been performed before the rise of Valyria, in the earliest age when Old Geese was first forming its empire. This legend has spread west from Ashai, and the followers of Relor claim that the hero was named Azor High, and prophesied his return. In the Jade Compendium, Koloko Votar recounts a curious legend from Yi-T, which states that the sun hid its face from Earth for a lifetime, ashamed of something none could discover, and that disaster was averted only by the deeds of a woman with a monkey's tail. Just that passage alone is confusing AF because they tell us of several different legends. They tell us of Azor High and his red sword, which is believed to be Lightbringer. And they tell us of a woman with a monkey's tail. And they tell us of Mother Roin's children and a secret song. And these are all Eastern legends from Yi-T, Ashai, and the Roin. But there's also the Western legend. In the north, they tell of a last hero who sought out the intercession of the children of the forest, his companions abandoning him or dying one by one as they faced ravenous giants, cold servants, and the others themselves. Alone, he finally reached the children, despite the efforts of the White Walkers, and all the tales agree, this was a turning point. Thanks to the children, the first men of the Night's Watch band together and were able to fight and win the Battle for Dawn, the last battle that broke the endless winter and sent the others fleeing to the icy north. So basically, we have numerous legends all about the ending of some darkness, some coldness. We have Azor Ahai and Lightbringer, a woman with a monkey's tail, Mother Roin's children, a secret song, and the last hero. In the ancient books, it's written that a warrior will draw a burning sword from the fire. And that sword shall be Lightbringer. Do you know the tale of the forging of Lightbringer? I shall tell it to you. It was a time when darkness lay heavy on the world. To oppose it, the hero must have a hero's blade. Oh, like none that had ever been. And so for 30 days and 30 nights, Azor High labored sleepless in the temple, forging a blade in the sacred fires, heat and hammer and fold, heat and hammer and fold. Oh yes, until the sword was done. Yet when he plunged it into the water to temper the steel, it burst asunder. Being a hero, it was not for him to shrug and go in search of excellent grapes such as these. So again, he began. The second time it took him 50 days and 50 nights and the sword seemed even finer than the first. Azor Ahai captured a lion to temper the blade by plunging it through the beast's red heart. 
but once more the steel shattered and split. Great was his woe and great was his sorrow then, for he knew what he must do. A hundred days and a hundred nights he labored on the third blade, and as it glowed white hot in the sacred fires, he summoned his wife. Nisa, Nisa, he said to her, for that was her name. Bear your breast and know that I love you best of all that is in the world. She did this thing. Why, I cannot say. And the Zorahai thrust the smoking sword through her living heart. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon. But her blood and her soul and her strength and her courage all went into the steel. Such is the tale of the forging of Lightbringer, the Red Sword of Heroes. Azura High sounds like a prick, to say the least. I love you, but fall on this sword for me. If you know LML, then you know he believes Azura High is, for lack of a better word, like Lucifer. Lucifer means light bringer. But anyway, I ran some of my ideas across his Twitter desk, and some of them are some conclusions that he's made as well. So you can check his channel out for more in-depth analysis. But what I want to talk about, what's really important, is where George R.R. R. Martin gets his inspiration from. Like my third video ever was based on how many sources in real histories and mythologies and different series that George gets his inspiration from. And I think when we look at those things, we get a deeper understanding or at least maybe a fraction of an understanding to what he's getting at. Which brings me to the forging of Lightbringer, but in particular, Nissa Nissa. George R.R. R. Martin incorporates real world mythology, folklore, legends, ideology, whatever, into his work. And Nissa Nissa becomes very interesting because of this. In Nordic folklore, there is a mythical creature called a Nice. A Nice is basically an elf or a gnome. There are folk tales where he is believed to be a shapeshifter, able to take a shape far larger than an adult man. Since Nice are thought to be skilled in illusion and sometimes able to make themselves invisible, one was unlikely to get more than a brief glimpse of him, no matter what he looked like. Norwegian folklore states that he has four fingers and sometimes with pointed ears and eyes reflecting light in the dark, like those of a cat. Nice are males, so Nisa would be a female. Now, in our story alone, who does that description fit? Who has four fingers, eyes of a cat, pointed ears, shapeshifters, or warks? I'll tell you. They had nut brown skin, dappled like a deer's with paler spots and larger ears that could hear things that no man could hear. Their eyes were big too, great golden cat eyes that could see down passages where a boy's eyes saw only blackness. Their hands had only three fingers and a thumb with a sharp black claws instead of nails. And they did sing. They sang in true tongue so Bran could not understand the words but their voices were as pure as winter air. Basically, the children of the forest matched the description of the Nordic folklore of a niece. So was Nisa Nisa a child of the forest? So let's look further into a niece from Nordic folklore. The niece is particularly related to the winter solstice. The winter solstice is the shortest day and longest night of the year. The longest night of the year. In pagan Scandinavian and Germanic people of Northern Europe celebrate a 12 day midwinter or winter solstice holiday called Yule. Many modern Christmas traditions such as the Christmas tree, the Christmas wreath, the Yule log and others are direct descendants of Yule customs. Yule is the time of greatest darkness and the longest night of the year. The winter solstice has been associated with the birth of a divine king long before the rise of Christianity. Since the sun is considered to represent the male divinity in many pagan traditions, this time is celebrated as the wait for it, return of the sun god. Does this not scream Azor High, Nisa Nisa, the long night, the Lord of light, like in all of that? 
Basically, the whole Azor High prophecy and the forging of Lightbringer is based on Nordic folklore, ancient Scandinavian folklore, legends, and myths. George got his inspiration from legends and myths and has passed them on to us into his story as legends and myths. So what is the likelihood of the return of a sun god, the warrior of fire, during the long night? If the legend or myth of Nisa Nisa is true, then it's my belief that Nisa Nisa was a child of the forest. And if you look even further than Nisa Nisa, you had the legend of the woman with the monkey's tail, whose deeds averted the long night. Could the children of the forest have tails? Possibly, but what's even more possible is that the woman having a monkey's tail is a flight of fancy. We saw how the tales of Tyrion when he was an infant made things more than what they were. The whole way from dawn, all anyone talked about was the monster that had been born to Tywin Lannister. A head twice the size of his body, a tail between his legs, claws, one red eye. The privates of both a girl and a boy. That would have made things so much easier. Your head was a bit large, your arms and legs were a bit small, but no claw. No red eye, no tail between your legs, just a tiny pink cock. There's also Mother Ruin and her children and this secret song. This river in Essos is called the Ruin. The children of the forest are literally called singers in the books. And the old tongue is literally the song of the earth. And Mother Ruin is a chief goddess. What's interesting is that legend tells us that the Roinar people had strange water magic with which the children of the forest are believed to have had as well, which is how they called the hammers of the waters to break the arm of Dorne and flood the neck. So you see, everything goes back to the children of the forest. Everything, every legend is tied to them in some significant way, even Azor Ahai and the forging of Lightbringer. What do you think? Was Nissa Nissa a children of the forest? And if so, what could that possibly mean? As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. I hope you guys had a very, very happy holidays and I wish you a happy new year. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Please click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell and join the sweet summer family. Okay, my sweet summer children, have a good day. Shame.